I, uh, I've dealt with a lot of danger in my life. And so my body responds differently to danger. Even if it's not real, you know, the response is real. And so You Need a Counselor podcast. This is episode 52 with Pete Turner today. My name is Julie Johnson. I'm the president and founder of Heart and Solutions. We're a counseling agency here in Iowa. Um, so definitely give us a call if you are at one of our nine office locations. And I'm Krista. I am the vice president at Heart and Solutions in charge of our behavioral health department, where we work with kids ages four to 18 um, in home and school and office, or right now telehealth as well on different behavioral skills. And this is our podcast, You Need a Counselor. So we are designed for people curious about counseling, but have barriers keeping them from experiencing the benefits of counseling. Our mission is to share stories about counseling, good, bad, and indifferent, and spread the message that everyone can benefit from mental health and behavioral health counseling services. So we post for audio and video on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. Um, so we do that on Sunday night because that gives you the entire week to get in touch with a counselor. Call your counselor and schedule if you haven't seen them in a while. Uh, and reach out to us because we can get you connected with a counselor in your zip code as well. All right. So today we've got a guest with us. Today we've got Pete Turner here. Hi, Pete. Welcome. Hey. Hey. hey, everybody. Hey, ladies. How are you all doing? It's great to be on your show. I really appreciate you having me. Yeah, we're, uh, we're doing great. Thank you. Awesome. So I'm going to bring on Pete a little bit so you guys know what he's all about. So um, Pete is a combat veteran. Um, he has done multiple tours um, on active duty. And gosh, he's got a lot to tell us about that. Um, and he's tried multiple different counseling styles and lots of different types of counseling services. Um, and so he, we are really excited to hear about your firsthand experience with all of these different counselors. Um, so Pete also is the host of the Break It Down show, which is a podcast that you guys can listen to. And I am super curious about <laughs> the Break It Down show because I love that title. So Pete, tell us about the Break It Down show first. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, Break It Down show I do. Well, I was doing five shows a week live wow. and posting to my YouTube channel. Yeah, I've been doing it for, well, since 2012, a long time. We got over a thousand episodes, if you can That's believe awesome. that. Yeah, it's and it's been a life changing experience. I've had so many people on the different on the show, musicians. I mean, world famous musicians, world famous authors. We've been talking about Afghanistan a lot lately, obviously, because my experience and the the unique uh, the people that I know who have done the job at a level that. You're just not going to hear on the regular news. And so we do, we don't just do war stuff. We, we do all kinds of art things, actors, directors, producers, all kinds of stuff. And I have my mind blown on a regular occasion. So it's one of the greatest things uh, I've ever done in my life. It's introduced me to, it's to so many people that have become my friends and it's just a life enriching thing. And, and you ladies know you've got a show and it's doing well. 52 episodes. Congratulations. That's a year's worth of shows. Yeah. Good for you. And so, you know, you know what it feels like, you know, how incredible it is and how, how it's changing your life. I mean, and it's going to continue. So I, I, uh, I salute you all to, uh, for doing it. And, um, I'm, I'm just like you guys, I just kept doing it and I just started earlier and kept doing it longer. That's it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It sounds like you get some really great guests and a lot of, a wide variety of guests on the show as well. A lot of different topics. Yeah, yeah, I'm fortunate in that uh, because of my skills as a spy, I I'm able to meet people and, and establish rapport with them and, you know, just, just create opportunities and conversations. When you've had as many, look, my, my job was to make friends with the most evil people I could find and, and try to understand complex situations, to do it across language, cross religion, cross culture. And so when I meet people on the show, I, I'm playing at the major league level. And so so it's, it is... Um, it's great. I've interviewed a lot of people in my life, whether it was in a combat setting or in a podcast setting. And it's, uh, again, like I just can't say enough things. It's such a, it's such a treasure trove of life enrichment and, and health and wealth and wellness. You know, it's just, 
I, I love it. And the Break It Down show is, is an engine for not only like healing and, and wellness overall, not, not by theme, but just by, by output, but also the um, one of the things that you get is, is you're forced to deal with, at least on my show, you know, I try to find uncomfortable conversations, whether it's social or political, those kind of things, and, and put myself squarely in there. And, and I'm not a really a, a partisan kind of person. I'm sort of you know in the middle. So I, I want to make sense out of complex things and have those conversations that we seem to struggle to have. That's a lot of what I do on the show. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I think I'm finding the biggest part of being a podcast host or interviewing people in general is just being so curious uh, <laughs> about everything that people uh, share, you know, and I think that that just sense of curiosity, I mean, I can hear it in you as you describe just these opportunities um, to be able to, and what a blessing it is to be able to interview so many different people uh, and get to learn from people on a, you know, either a weekly or, or daily basis, like you were doing live shows. That's that's incredible, um, but it is just a neat way to to learn so many different things and different points of view. So I love that. That sounds like an awesome show. So I'll be really excited to to listen to that one as well. Awesome. So you know, we I would love to hear about your counseling experiences. Um, so it sounds like you've been to a wide variety of counselors. How many would you say that you've been to? Oh my gosh, uh, you know, in the <laughs> VA, uh, they bounce you around depending on contracts and and clinics and everything else. So it took a while to find a home uh -huh. um, for my counseling because, you know, you've got to try some group and you've got to try some one-on-one -on -one and then different kinds of one-on-one -on -one in different locations. And again, like, it, it's funny, contracts shouldn't get in the way and budget shouldn't get in the way of, of mental health, but but it's part of the equation with the VA. Yeah. So I, I can't even tell you... Um, over a dozen, probably different styles and people, um, wow. which I, I think is a good, healthy way to approach it, though. I mean, it forced me to kind of be open to what the experience was and then also to recognize that, hey, this this isn't working or I'm unsure of where we are. And so instead of being passive, you know, I'll say to my, my specific um, therapist now, I'll say, I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what we're accomplishing. And I say this in a friendly way, but um <laughs> You know, I, I, I feel stuck or I feel unsure. I'm not, you know, like, what are we doing? And then, you know, we refocus on that aspect of, of what it is that we're doing, because sometimes the progress is slow and the realizations take time to put into practice and that kind of thing. Yeah, I love that because when you describe therapy, you describe it as though it's a contact sport. I mean, I think sometimes people think that therapy and counseling is kind of a passive thing that is done to us, right? So like when we go to uh, the doctor and we get an exam, that's kind of something that's done to us. We go get an MRI, that's something that's done to us. And I love your description of counseling because you're in the driver's seat mm -hmm. and you're active. You're an active participant in those counseling sessions. And if you're like, what are what are we doing here? <laughs> what is the point of this session? What was the point of last session? Yeah. I love that you're identifying that because you know that you're investing your time. You're investing time that you could potentially be working on different things that you have for goals. And you're able to say that to your counselor. I love that. And it sounds like the variety of counselors that you've had has kind of worked to your advantage so that you are comfortable saying those things. Yeah, I'm, I'm for sure comfortable for the most part. You know, I, I don't want to act like I'm some kind of superhero or anything. But, um, I, you know, I have no problem saying, you know, um, what are we doing? You know, that's the biggest thing. Like, what are we trying to accomplish here? But also my therapist, she's familiar with the VA system. She's a, a veteran herself. And she'll like, I'll bring up the things that are bothering me. And sometimes we just don't do really therapy at all and we just work on this aspect of the VA because the VA is maddening I mean when I say this like it, it get, it'll make me want to kill myself it'll get me it'll increase my suicidal ideation right I'm not yeah. I'm not in jeopardy I'm not I'm not gonna do anything about it um, and also I don't have to say that to her every time she knows that like we've built like safety rails around that yeah. so so okay I'll, I'll give you a good example I had to do a thing for court where I had to go to um I had to go to alcohol uh like you know, not, not AA, but AA, right. And the VA. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have an alcohol problem. Uh, my therapist doesn't think I have an alcohol problem and me going to an alcohol problem counseling is, is just going to cause problems because I'm going to be honest, right. Cause you can't go in there and like, and, and make what well, you shouldn't go up there and make things up. And yeah. so <laughs> we would get to my turn and I, they'd say, how you doing? And I'm like, I'm doing fine. <laughs> like, Did you have any drinks this week? 
yes. You know, I'm like, I don't have a problem when they're like, oh, okay. Okay. You don't have a problem. And I'm like, I don't, I, you know, I just, cause I don't have a drinking problem. And when you don't have a drinking problem and you go to an AA type meeting, it, it just derails the entire meeting, you know? Yeah. And, and it, these are the things where like, you know, because of court, I had to comply with it and get through it, but I had to go to the counselor offline and say, listen, I really don't have a drinking problem. And it's just my not having a drinking problem is distracting your entire group mm. because everybody is convinced that I don't have it. And, and, and even as I say it, like, I really don't have a drinking problem, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it, but it's so, it's so hard to believe when you're in, like, it's impossible because everybody says that, but the reality is, is I don't drink every day. I don't, never just sit down and drink a whole bottle of anything. You know, I, I have drinks in the evening. Sometimes I may have a, a beer after this because my weekend starts and I'm going on vacation. That's not an alcoholic. You know, I don't, I don't depend on it. I don't need it, but you have to say all these things to get out of this situation that you're in. And so I think that also applies to the, the stuff that I do is I've reached a point with trust with my, my counselor that I can say things to her and I don't have to say, I'm not going to kill myself. I'm fine. I mean, I have to kind of say, look, I'm not, I'm not in danger. Right. And we know that we can now go past that point and I can say, here's the thing that's, I think is triggering my, my yeah. SI, mm-hmm. right. you know, but that yeah. took a long time to get to that point where she felt comfortable because she holds a responsibility for my well being, you know, and I'm yeah. like, I swear I'm fine today right now, but there, but I am worried about getting, opening that gate that I don't know the pathway back through that gate. And all of a sudden I'm in this darker place or, you know, worrying about trap doors. I mean, that's a big thing for me is, you know, I, uh, I've dealt with a lot of danger in my life. And so my body responds differently to danger, even if it's not real, you know, the response is real. And so that, that familiarity that we've developed over time. And I think through my honesty in terms of like, I do, I have the urge to kill myself. I'm not going to act on it today. And I don't want to, dismiss what the danger is because it was a lot more present and close before but i also know that other people have killed themselves and they've been in the exact same spot as me so i'm always aware of it but i can't be afraid to talk about it because the person who's next in line behind me needs to understand that this is manageable and it requires it's like going to the gym it's like handling a gun it's like any of these things that we do dealing with covid you know it's a thing you have to deal with and and so that's that's sort of where I'm at with my counseling. Yeah, no, I love that because, you know, these are things that are difficult to, to admit sometimes to ourselves, right? If we've got suicidal ideation, we're not telling that to many of the people around us because we care about our friends and our family, right? And so we get into this, this, this cycle of like, well, I don't want to say that to that person because I don't want to upset them. I don't want to upset my parents. I don't want to upset my sibling, right? And so a counselor, I love that, you know, a counselor, yeah, When you first say that to a counselor, we know that they've got things they've got to do. They've got things they've got to go through. And what I love about your story is that you're saying, like, just bear with that. Like, just know, like, they got to do that. But if you push through that and you continue to build that relationship with that counselor, then you can get through that to the other side, where now you can openly say to that person in that room and in that space, I'm having suicidal ideation today. And it's not like, oh my gosh, shock and awe, right? There's so much reaction that people have to that. It's like, oh, okay, that's a symptom. Mm -hmm. Suicidal ideation, even homicidal ideation is a symptom. And so it's the same as going to the doctor and saying, I have a scratchy throat, right? The doctor's not like, oh my goodness, right? They're like, let's figure out why you have a scratchy throat. Right. And like you said, you push through that, you build that trust and that rapport, that trust is so important with that therapist to where you get now can go, okay, now we're through to the other side. I can say this to you and we can actively work on that as a symptom and go, what's behind that? What was going on this week? What was going on with my, you know, my wellness routine? What was going on with what changes were happening with me um, that might have triggered that? today or might have triggered that yesterday even though it's not triggered today you know just like that puzzle of ourselves um so i love that and it sounds like it sounds like you are really intentional about being extremely honest and upfront with your therapist and it sounds like that really helped you to build that relationship as well yeah i think that's fair Um, the the ability to to be honest with my therapist has has improved our ability to deal with my thing because it's, it's, um, 
we, I hadn't been able to get to the little things and we had put me in more of this, um, uh, you know, this variety of, of therapy. Um, and I don't want to identify it's not really important. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get there, but the important thing was, is, is the VA and I worked on figuring out, okay, what do you need on the regular? And so we finally got something that made sense. And then we built a relationship and now we can talk about those specific things like, um, you know, I'm looking for triggers, right? So what do I do if, if I recognize a pattern? Um, what are the things that could be triggers that I recognize, you know, whatever it is, like if I open this drawer, why do I feel like I want to kill myself, you know? And then maybe it's not the drawer. Maybe it's um, the fact that, I don't know. So like I take naps every day as part of my therapy, right? I, I, I meditate and just fall asleep. And it's a maintenance thing. I don't do it every single day, but, but that's my norm is to take a nap every day. And it resets my brain. And I've also started to add in, and I'm not great at this part, but I started to add in a break in the morning where I just purposely take a break and just sort of, you know, just relax and reduce the amount of stress and pressure I put on myself. I can't always do it, you know, because of schedule, but I, but I build that into my schedule just as if you would, you know, an eating plan or whatever, you know, like at 10 o'clock, I'm going to drink eight ounces of water or whatever. And that's sort of how I look at it. And these are things we've been able to develop because again, we got past that point of being shocked by the SI. We realized that I have it every day. Um, the other thing I have is the dread of the SI. I know what's coming. Wow. And I start freaking out. It's like wow. when you think you're going to get a migraine, you start to panic a little bit because, you know, where's my drugs? I've got to control my situation. And so yeah. I would have a similar kind of thing. And so we've also worked to produce that. So there's, there's like, it's not even SI, it's the anxiety about the SI because it's wow. not pleasure. It's, there's nothing enjoyable about SI, you know, yeah. even if I'm not going to act on it, you know, uh, yeah. and, and how bad is it going to be? Right. Like I, so I've learned to make it okay to slow my whole day down if it gets really bad and, and just focus on the care part of it. You know, before I would just push through and then not deal with it. And then it would mount and stack and get bigger. And, and now I'm able to kind of deflate that balloon. And when I recognize it, and I didn't have those tools two years ago. I didn't have that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that being able to, to slow it down. I love what you're talking about there because our lives get so busy and especially with something that we are have anxiety about, there's like our natural reaction sometimes to something that we have anxiety about is to avoid it. So, and then, you know, and the more that we avoid it, the more that it builds up to us and the more scary it is when it comes to us or when we think it might be coming to us. Um, and so I love what you're talking about, about slowing down because it feels so counterintuitive to slow down, to slow down our day, you know, um, because sometimes we think, well, maybe I have it because, or maybe I have these feelings or these thoughts because, you know, I have to get things done or because of how my life is designed, you know, things like that. And what you're saying is, no, we have control over that. We have power over our life and what our day looks like and what we do or don't do to take care of ourselves. Um, and I love that you, you know, kind of took, took control of that and you're telling other people that they can, can take control of that too. I think that's really inspiring. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I'm not necessarily trying to inspire anybody, but what I am trying to do is make sure that I'm taking care of me. And then, you know, be an example of like, this is possible for somebody else, you know, yeah. a lot. One of the charities actually I'm wearing the shirt for now, Save the Brave. It's the charity I work with because we're trying to get veterans to want to stop killing themselves. You know, it's not a, it's not about awareness. We're aware that this is going on, yeah. you know, how do we do it? And so I'm trying to lead by example, learn out loud and, and, uh, yeah, you know, not make it okay because everybody's it's okay for everybody. I'm, and nobody needs my permission to do these things. But one of the things, because of the kind of uh, service member I was, I was an alpha. Uh, I went out a lot, and because of that, you know, I always have this urge to go, 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 go. And so to learn the uh, the skill of of doing less, of taking the bar that I'd set at eight eight feet above my head and trying to jump over it every day, I'm like, I can take this bar today and I can put it on the floor. And I can just walk over it and, and, and that'd be, that'd be good enough because, you know, the damage it, and I was trying to explain this to a friend of mine, you know, like during the Olympics, when a couple of people were having some, some mental health moments, you know, if you saw that wound on their body, if you saw my, my shoulder had my PTSD on it, you would treat me differently 
than you would when you see a relatively handsome man who's in good shape or whatever, right? You know, that, those, it's easy to, to make this narrative that isn't true. Like I, you know, there's a lot of damage in there and, and uh, you know, I don't drop the D from PTSD because mine appears to be a disorder. I mean, until it gets better, um, I've got to always work on ordering up the disorder. And, and that's okay. Like these, uh, there's nothing wrong with rephrasing it and saying it's growth. But the reality is, is that it's, it's not fun and there's a lot of damage. And so, yeah, sure. There's growth, but maybe, maybe I'm still working on closing up the wound that won't close. And it's scary because it won't close. And so dealing with that, you know, that's sort of where, where I'm at. Like I have this and then hopefully someone else can identify with that and say, Oh, okay. Pete has this. And maybe I'll be a node for help. Maybe I'll just be like, uh, huh, what else can I try? Or I don't know. Um, that, that's how I look at all of those things. It's just, if we could see the wound, we would act differently. If we, you know, like when you see someone who's sick with cancer, you're like, God, you look so horrible. What can I do to help? You know, it should be the same kind of thing with depression, anxiety, PTSD, yeah. whatever it is, you know, like, Hey, you need it. You need a day off. All right. You know, that we'll, we'll just go sell refrigerators tomorrow. You know, don't worry about it. Go, go take a day off, you know? Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. That's such a great example. I mean, the, the wounds that, that we experience through our lifetimes, you know, at, at varying levels and they're all wounds, you know, <laughs> so no matter what the size of our wound is or what caused it, they're all wounds and they're all, they all do take time to heal. And just because something's healing doesn't mean it's not a wound. <laughs> um, so I really love that because I think there is this, um, you know, this, I, I, I agree with you. I think there's some benefit to, to turning some of these things and trying to make them a little more positive or make them a little more growth oriented. At the same time, what you're talking about is validating the fact that like, yeah, but I gotta live with this. Like I gotta live this in my day-to-day -day life and me saying that it's growth and saying that, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll be better for it doesn't help the fact that I wake up in the morning feeling this way, right? Or that I wake up, I go to take a shower and I start thinking these thoughts, right? And so what I love about what you're saying is that, yeah, there's validation in there and there's room for both. And they don't have to be, you know, one or the other. It can be, yeah, that's true, but also like this sucks and these symptoms suck and I don't like it, you know? And I would prefer not to have them. Um, that's, those are also valid things to say, and I think they're important things to say, because when, we, you know, just the term mental health is focused on mental health <laughs> and, you know, the, that healthy part, and that is really, really beneficial for a lot of people, but sometimes that can be a barrier for people going, okay, but like, what about my actual lived experience? Does that matter? Does anybody recognize that? Um, and I think what you're doing and I think what you what you're sharing with uh, not only your therapist, but people that you talk to about mental health diagnoses in general, to people that you talk to about what it's like to have suicidal ideation, because, you know, when we go through our daily life, we're interacting with people who have daily suicidal ideation every single day. And we don't know it. We don't know who it is. We're blindfolded to that. We have no idea because those wounds are on the inside. We can't see them. And so we're interacting with people all the time. And when we have them, we think we're the only one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what I love about what you're sharing is that, no, we can say that to people. We can build relationships um, either with a therapist. We can build those relationships with other people um, that we're able to say what is going on with us. And, and kind of get past that shock factor that I think sometimes people have, have uh, fear about or anxiety about, you know, if I say this to somebody, how are they gonna react? I think there's there's some of that too, that you're saying like, man, we can blast right through that, right? It's not pleasant, it's, it's not pleasant blasting through a brick wall either, but we can do it <laughs> and then we get to the other side where really that building can happen. Um, so I'm curious too about the VA because um, VA and mental health uh, benefits that it sounds like a labyrinth, um, just trying to navigate all of that and navigating all of that while you're having PTSD symptoms, while you're having uh, different major 
depressive symptoms or, uh, you know, suicidal ideation or even homicidal ideation, and then trying to go through the process of even just getting help. So what are some of the things that you've found to be, what, what's the worst part of that? And then what, what are some of the things that you've found to be helpful while navigating that? Because you've done it. You've been through it successfully. So let's try to help some other people too. Well, when you're not mentally well, and that sounds way worse than it is, but um, I was willing to feel better and believe that I could. And so I would go, even if I wasn't the best version of me, even if I was surly, even if I would get up and walk out of an office because I was done and, you know, because that's what I had that day. That was all right. But I would always make myself like set the next appointment, go back, do whatever it was, because I knew that I knew the VA was going to frustrate me. Any system would. But one of the things I think that counselors need to hear is so I walk in. And there's an intake form to fill out. So and now I'm, I'm now asked to, to write down the crappiest days of my life and put myself in a mindset of this thing and then review them as if it's nothing, you know, because the clinician's like, well, we have to do intake. And I really I firmly believe there needs to be a step. Uh, you know, if you've got someone in my case, and I'm not trying to speak about anything else because I, I know about PTSD, depression, and anxiety that I have. But when you have that person sit down, ask permission to talk about this. Hey, uh, we're going to fill out an intake form. And it's going to ask you history stuff. If you don't want to fill it out, don't fill it out. We'll talk about it in the office, something like that. Or, Hey, uh, I want to cover some of your, the things that have happened because when you've been on a thousand combat patrols, look, when you try to understand my life, I've been hit by a tank. Right. Yeah. And that changes your reality. Right. I've been, um, I've been dropped off by a helicopter in the middle of, a, of an area that was not safe to be and had to walk by myself back up to my camp with nobody else around. That's terrifying for people, right? And so when someone says, what was the moment like? The moment, which one? Which which moment would you like me to relive for you, you emmer effort? You know, like it's, yeah. it's, it's a... You're asking me to punch myself in my wound over and over again, and, and you haven't even earned the right to do that. So I'm definitely... I'm vocal about that with clinicians because it's easy to go, this is the administrative task I have to accomplish. Well, this is also the beginning of your therapy session. And especially if I'm not going to talk to you ever again, because you're an entry point, then you'd better handle it. At least in the VA, you'd better handle it more delicately than this is what has to happen. If it takes you three meetings to get through this thing in a respectful fashion, then it takes you three meetings. But what you can't do is sit someone down and have them write out all this horrible stuff, put them in that mindset, and then come in and listen to them talk about it again, and then go from there. It's just, it's, um, it, it's not helpful. And it, it, you will chase away people that are like, I'm not doing that. You know, they had this like, this like peaceful room that they would gather us in as we waited. And it was not peaceful. It was a stressful room, Yeah. you know? And so look, it's got form and function. And, and all that stuff has to happen in there, but they have this pleasant music going on. And I wanted to throw a chair through the window because the damn pleasant music was enraging me. I'm like, stop, you know, like, I, and look, I, I don't know what the answer is. You can't please everybody. But I knew that when I was in there, I'm like, I just want to get out of this room. Can I wait somewhere else? You know? Yeah. If you want to go wait in the hallway, just walk around, just go pace, whatever, go do that. That's fine, you know, but um, but unless you know to ask, unless you know that kind of thing, and unless the clinician understands that I don't want to just open up and talk about the worst days of my life, I, you know, if you want to ask me questions about me in general, and then start to creep into that, okay, but let's not let's not start there because it's um, it's inappropriate, frankly. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got I got a um kind of come alongside you with that because you know so. When we do assessments, we we ask questions and we go through like symptoms first because behaviors are way easier to talk about when you first meet somebody, right? Than than experiences. Yeah. And yeah. so we go through and we do that in our assessments. However, I will say that um, so I ended up switching therapists this fall, and whenever I switch therapists, I go through like. 10 different therapists to see who I connect with. And oh my gosh, there were so many, and especially now, there were so many online forms that you had to fill up. So not only, you know, hey, sit here and fill this out, but hey, log into this portal 
and fill out all your information in the portal. And two, two of the therapists, they wanted me to fill out all of these measures. And it was like 25 measures. And I was like, are you going to look at these later? <laughs> like, what is this? And then I get into one of the assessments where I had filled out all the stuff. And she's like, okay. And she was asking me the same questions that I just filled out. And I'm going, what is this? Um, and it wasn't a conversation. And I think, you know, the, the biggest piece and what I'm, what I'm hearing from what you're saying is too, that I love when you said they haven't earned it, right? Yeah. Make your therapist <laughs> earn it um, by building that relationship, by having a conversation with you and by treating you like an individual person. Um, and so I, I have, I've been through that experience or similar experience just recently where I was like, oh my gosh, why is it so hard <laughs> to get into therapy? Like, why is it so hard? Um, and, you know, I mean, I can control what our agency does, but not the ones that I'm going to therapy with. And I was like, man, this is a lot of paperwork. This is a lot of like, enter your pin and get, you know, get logged into our system. Like, this is a lot of tech. And complicated. It's complicated. Uh, and then, like you said, describe any past trauma. I'm like, okay. From the beginning? <laughs> exactly. Right? Like, it was a cold day in September. <laughs> Um, and so absolutely, I, I can so relate with what you're saying because there's, it feels like there's so many hoops to jump through. But what I also love about what you're saying is that you have the right and I have the right and Krista has the right when we go to a therapist to know what we can expect and to know that there are therapists out there who understand that. There are therapists out there who are going to focus more on building rapport with you, right? Like, yeah, they got to write some stuff down, but they are going to be focused on getting to know you as a human uh, while they do the, the checkbox kinds of things that they need to do. And we can expect that. We deserve that. And so we can say to somebody, if they're not doing that, we can say, I said to one provider, I said, that was the most awkward assessment I have ever sat. I've done a million of them. I was like, that is the most awkward thing I have ever done. And I did not go back to that therapist. Um, and it's okay to do that. It's okay to give that feedback to a therapist because the therapist is either going to say, oh man, like, okay, that tells me something about you. Let's try something different. Or they're not. And if they don't, then you learn something about that, that therapist, but we know that there are other therapists who do understand and who are going to respect that. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, man, we change therapists. Sometimes things happen, we gotta change therapists. But what I love about what you've learned along the way is that you are the advocate, you are in the driver's seat. You know what you can expect. You know what your rights are as a client and you can advocate for that for yourself. Yeah, for sure. And I look at it, it's, it's no different than hiring a trainer for your body where you're, you're trying to, um, like, I have, my shoulders are wrecked. I just got a cortisone shot today or at the VA. And so if I go to a trainer, they're like, I need you to do this exercise or whatever. Like, hey, uh, by the way, my shoulder is injured. I've got bursitis and, you know, I'm working on rehabbing this thing. You know, then they can adjust to, to what I need, but you have to be vocal for it. And I'm not saying you challenge every single thing. But um, if, if I go to, if I have a need to get a new therapist, I promise you right now, I'm not filling the intake form out. I'll give you my basic information, but I'm not going to spend an hour reliving my past. That's on you as the therapist, from my point of view, to figure out what it is. And again, you have to earn that. So yes, we're going to work together, maybe, but um, maybe not. And so you're on the interview table as much as I am. And I'm, I want to understand like, you know, what we're, what we're getting into here and you need to be comfortable with me not wanting to uh, dive into the pool <laughs> straight away. You know, it's just for me, I don't, that puts me in jeopardy when I have to break that wound open or pound into it. You know, I'm glad to do work. That's hard. I need to know that you're going to be there though. You know, um, the VA is really bad about this. Like their video teleconference stuff never works. And they'll, or, or it'll send you 10,000, I'm not even joking, like 10,000 notices that you have. Hey, eight o'clock today, you're like, pages, right? You're like, wow, BA, seriously, can you get video teleconferencing right? And so if, if this is what you're looking at and, and, you're, and you're at all shy about doing this, 
you know, there's stuff that I still haven't revealed to my therapist. This is several years into the game because I'm not sure I need to, but maybe I do, but I'm not comfortable doing it yet. Right. And so you have all of these things that you don't know about the person who's sitting across from you. And, and I want to, I want to get to know, I want to know that that person will actually answer the phone and not just route me through to a crisis line or whatever, you know, I, I'm not going to get a hold of anybody inappropriately, but if I need to get a hold of you, I, I need to believe with my whole life that you'll be there. Selecting a therapist or, you know, starting to work with a therapist, it's kind of like dating. I mean, think about how much you reveal to a first date, right? You're not going on a date and telling this person your entire life story on that first date. You're kind of getting a feel for who they are and if there's a connection there and if you feel safe with them and how comfortable everybody feels. Um, but with therapy, there tends, tends to be this kind of feeling or expectation that, right away we need to be revealing all of ourselves and that we're not doing it right if we don't share every detail of who we are and what we think and how we feel um, in that first appointment and, and i'm with you i mean every therapist is different and just like every first date we might go on is different you know if i'm a single person and i go on 20 dates maybe one of those feel like, feels like a good date and ends up being a relationship um, and it's the same thing with therapy, you know, I always say, if you are looking for a therapist, look for multiple therapists, because the chances that you're, if I only went on one date and tried to get married, <laughs> the odds of that working out are slim to none. And so if I, but if I cast kind of a wider net and I go, yeah, I'm going to do a bunch of assessments because I'm going to see how these, how this therapist is, I have no way to know that until I'm in the session with them. And, you know, I have no way to know how somebody is on Tinder. What is that one? Bumble? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Until I'm on a date with them, right? So you, you got to do, my, my mom used to say, you know, you got to kiss a lot of frogs <laughs> before you find your prince. And it's kind of that way with therapy. You got to kiss a lot of frogs. You got to go to a lot of uncomfortable intakes. But the, the knowledge that... I am still in control. I am the patient. I am the client, whatever that therapist is going to call me, right? But this is my session. This is my time. This is my session. And I get to use that session in the way that I need to, you know? So I loved when you said, like, sometimes I'll leave the session and I'll be salty in that session, right? Or I'll leave that session and I'll be like, nope, I'm done and walk out. But that's, if that's useful to you, if that's useful to me to like go in there and complain for an hour, right? Even if I'm not a complainer type person in my life or work, that's what it's about. That's what it's for. So I love that. I love that um, what you're stressing about that ability to speak out for what you can expect, what your rights are uh, and what, what therapists are able to do and, and can do. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really important um, because I think a lot of times people get discouraged. They get to start, not only the VA, right? Like, like you said, any system is flawed and frustrating and obnoxious. So yeah, VA healthcare, uh, if you've got private insurance or if you've got state insurance, you know, uh, there's all these hoops to go through. You gotta get stuff pre-authorized. You gotta count how many sessions you've had that they'll pay for all of that stuff, um, it, is, it is challenging to get into counseling. And we don't say that enough on this show. Um, you know, this show is called Unique Counselor. Uh, we talk a lot about benefits of counseling, but I love that you're coming on here and saying, it is hard getting into counseling. And it is, it absolutely is. And there doesn't need to be a solution for that. It just needs to be said, I think. Yeah, like when I go to the pool, there's like this bubble around the pool that keeps me from getting in to go swim laps. And so I have to get up out of my couch or off my, you know, out of my house. I have to get in my car and drive to the pool. And I love swimming. I love it. It's a great workout. You cannot feel uh, anything but happy and you can't. You're not going to want to kill yourself when you're swimming. And if, if you do, you just swim harder, you know. But um, there's this dome that I have to like I have to break through to get into the pool. And so it's the same thing for me with, with counseling it is, um, and, and I think the tele, the telemedicine stuff for me has been really helpful because it removes one of those barriers. I no longer have to go there. And this is a big thing. I think also with the VA, I don't know about other locations, 
but the VA is is also worried about the VA's numbers, right? And so they'll say, hey, uh, so I'll go to get like my, my, my psychiatrist assessment at the VA in Long Beach, right? Which is not far, but it's a gigantic building. It's like going to a college campus. And you're like, where am I going to park? Oh my gosh, I've got to walk here. And where is this building? And it's amazed because it's like, here's a billion dollars of, of building. Here's another billion dollars. And there's like all these hallways and it's this crazy wow. thing, right? It's super hard to navigate. And then, so the counselor will say, or the psychiatrist will say, well, why don't you come here for some group sessions? And they're really good. And I'm like, yeah, well, why don't you come to Santa Ana where I am? And he's like, well, that's too far to drive. And I'm like, well, then the same thing. And I do it on purpose because again, they get this institutional mindset of what's good for me. And um, they lose sight of the fact that they wouldn't make the same move themselves and and look, the counselor doesn't need to come to me, but they need to understand what it means to come to them. Because that's, I mean, imagine if you have a regular nine to five job and you've got a therapy session for 10 o'clock once every other week or something, and it takes you out of, of the workday for three or four hours. Yep. I mean, that's being realistic because if I go in at 10, so it's, I've got to leave 45 an hour minutes, an hour um, ahead of time park, get there on time, check in, sit there for 15 minutes. My time comes up. We do our session, leave. Oh, now I got to get lunch. And then I drive back. It's like, where have you been all day? Like, well, I was getting my therapy session. You know, oh. that's, that's asking a lot of a patient. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. It is. There's a lot of barriers and I, I agree with you. I love telehealth. I think it's awesome uh, I because you can do it on your lunch hour. It takes an hour to do a telehealth session. You know, it doesn't take commuting there, parking, you know, feeding the meter, all of that stuff um, that just kind of gets in the way and, and adds to anxiety, um, you know, and just, just the idea of, well, what if, what if something comes up and I miss my session or I'm late to my session, you know, things like that. So I do, I love telehealth. I hope that it continues on as well, um, just because it, it is so much more convenient and it, it removes a lot of those barriers, you know. You can just, if you have a pool in your house, uh, you just jump right in the pool, you know? You don't have to put on shoes. You don't have to put gas in your car. Um, all of that stuff, it, it, it's, it's gone with telehealth. So I, I love telehealth too. I agree, it's awesome. So, I mean, gosh, I, I think that you've discussed so many really, uh, so many issues that I think a lot of people do cope with by themselves on a daily basis. And these are such isolating issues, right? Like waking up and feeling like I want to kill myself. That, that doesn't, that's not a connecting feeling. Um, and our natural supports, we can't always go to our natural supports with that because we don't want to freak them out. We don't want to upset them. We don't want to disrupt them. And so I love that, you know, people can hear you say, I have these thoughts. I cope with these thoughts on a daily basis, right? And I am learning. Two years ago, I didn't have these skills. And every day and every week, I am learning more about, not more about counseling or mental health. I'm learning more about me. I'm learning more about what helps me. When I go a day without taking my nap, I feel that. I can feel that. And every time that happens, I go, oh, that next nap is all that more, more important, you know? And I love that. I think that's so helpful. So uh, if you were to give a suggestion to somebody who may be on the fence about counseling, um, and, and maybe they're looking at the bureaucracy and all the red tape of going through the VA to get counseling, what suggestion might you give to that person if they're on the fence? Yeah, just work on it because you can get better. You, you can make progress. I, I was, I had no patience for anything. Uh, I expected the VA to fail me. And, and at times it has, right? Absolutely. But it's something that is navigable. There are so many people that want to help you through the VA process. And they are a lot of times in the VA. And sometimes you just have to snap them out of the spell and just say, Hey, I'm an actual human talking to you here. I actually need help with this. And they're like, oh, sorry, because they get institutional brain, right? And so sometimes you can just grab their attention and then they'll bend over backwards to, to give you the help that you need and, and have earned, quite frankly. So if you're on the fence, get off the fence and, and go deal with this thing because if, if your life isn't going to get better, that's not true, um, you can try counseling and maybe it gets worse. It's not going to get worse. You know, you're going to go out and you're going to do things that, are going to slowly uh, improve your ability to care for your well-being. 
you know, we, we all have to care for our spiritual, mental, and physical health. And that requires maintenance uh, to do all of those things. You have to go to church or whatever it is that you want to call church. You have to go to the gym or dojo or Pilates or yoga, whatever it is. And the same thing applies to mental health is it requires, especially as you get older, there's just, look, a lot of these things are tied in, in between systems too. Better diet means better mental health. If you have a horrible diet, you're feeding your brain things that makes it go, well, you're giving me crap. So here's some crap outputs. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would just say in general that, that right there, just don't take on the whole thing at once. And it's okay to be where you're at and it's okay to have a bad day. And it's okay to say today's a bad day. I'm not doing anything but surviving today. And those things are fine, but didn't just get up and do it the next day. I love that. That's awesome advice. Really, really great. Um, I love in particular the part about, you know, there are people that work in the VA, they're humans. And if you, if you <laughs> make it known that you are also a human, they're working there for a reason, right? They want to help. Um, it's just, you kind of got to, you got to speak up and say, <laughs> say that because it does kind of snap them out of that. And, and then there is help there. So I love that. That's awesome. Hey, I'm Pete A. Turner, and I need a counselor. Awesome. And then, uh, so the podcast is the Break It Down Show. And so if you want to hear more of uh, Pete and uh, his interviews with, oh my gosh, such a variety of different guests. Um, and really, it sounds like you get really deep into nitty gritty, uh, which is awesome. So uh, listen to that one, the Break It Down Show. And that's on YouTube as well, right? Yeah, that's my preferred location. Just type in Pete A. Turner on YouTube. It's going to come up. There's, there's, there's a lot of them there. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So uh, go to YouTube, The Break It Down Show, Pete A. Turner on YouTube. You'll see all of his videos. Uh, very, very cool. Very inspiring. Well, thank you so much for being here, Pete. Yeah, thanks. My pleasure. Um, all right. So if you are in Iowa and you are looking for a counselor uh, to do telehealth, telehealth is awesome. That's what I do also uh, with my counselor. I do telehealth. I don't have time to drive to Waterloo <laughs> for counseling. So uh, if you're in Iowa, anywhere in Iowa, give us a call 800-531-4236 for you or your kiddos for mental health counseling or behavioral health counseling. Like Julie mentioned at the beginning, we post every Sunday at 5 p.m. Central Time, our new episodes on YouTube, Spotify, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, so save up whatever boring tour you want to do, listen to us Sunday, and we can help you get ready to call a counselor and get set up for services that week. Absolutely. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at You Need a Counselor Podcast. Uh, you can send us a DM on Instagram as well if you have questions about counseling in general. Uh, or if you've got questions for Pete and you'd like us to have Pete back on the show, we'd love to have him. Uh, and if you've got questions you'd like to hear on that episode, let us know there too. I'm Krista Brown. I'm Julie Johnson. And we need a counselor. And so do you. Bye. Bye.